I wrote down a solution. Have a look at what you did and have a look at the solution. And we can uh, be happy to answer your questions. It's written on both sides. Don't get full. <laughs> uh, so I was rather creative, as always, to grade this. Uh, in all, there are eight questions, if you count the sub-questions and everything. And what I did is I took uh, the five best of your eight, and each one was on 20 points. I did that because. Uh, it was apparently a little long, uh, longer than I, I thought, and so I saw that several of you stayed until the end, which wasn't my my intention. But uh, it's good to have two hours and 30 minutes actually for this class, because uh, in the past I have taught it in one hour and 15 minutes, and it's very short for a class like that to to give a test in one hour and 15 minutes. So it's good that we can go over, but I, I didn't want you to use the whole period, but since you, you had this option, it was good. OK, any, any question or comment on uh, this test? So really, uh, have a look at the solution. Have a look at what you did, because these are pretty basic stuff that you need to be able to do. And so uh, another thing about grading, and so, uh, those of you who have been in my classes already know that, uh, the final supersedes everything else if the final is better than the average. Mm, OK? So that's not to, because some younger students then decide not to do anything until the end, which I'm sure you won't, uh, you are more mature and you won't uh, have this uh, deadly strategy. So, but uh, it, it helps sometimes. Uh, people do get a, a better grade at the end and uh, it's their final grade. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the homework which was assigned for today. So we have two. Oh, That's what I, I didn't. I didn't assign to L. Oh, okay. Huh. Uh. Now we should still do it because it's uh, it's an important uh, technique. So uh, what do we need to do? Proof uh, proposition 220. So a proposition, uh, you have two things to prove. The first one, which is the important one, is to show that if the integral of f is finite, then uh, f is finite almost everywhere. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, uh, what you can do is first uh, look at the following. So I claim this first. 
that we have this inequality. Why? Well, there are two possibilities. So this is the indicator function of the set f bigger than n, which means that it's 1. If f of x is bigger than n, it's 0 otherwise. So you see, on this side, uh, I can get f of x or 0. And on this side, I always get f of x. So this is clearly always bigger than that, because f is a positive function. Okay, they are either, both sides are either equal, or this side is zero and this side is f of x. So this works over time. Now, the other thing that we can remark is that this is bigger than n, uh, right. This is bigger than n times 1f bigger than n. So why? Well, same type of reasoning. You have to look at uh, case by case. Uh, either f of x is bigger than n. And in that case, I have f of x here, and I have n here. But I'm, in, in, I'm precisely in the set f of x bigger than n, so this is a true inequality. Or f of x is not bigger than n, so I have 0 here. But I also have 0 here, so I'm, I'm fine again. Okay, so every time you need to check both cases to check that your inequalities are true. Okay, now the other thing we know already about the Lebesgue integral is that it's an increasing uh, operator. So we can take integrals on uh, both sides. So f d mu is bigger than n f n d mu. But this side is a simple function. OK, it's uh, constant times uh, indicator of a measurable set. This is measurable because it's the inverse image of an open interval. So we know that this whole thing is simple. And so this is n times mu of this set. This is indicator of f bigger than n. Than x? Oh, d mu. Oh, that's okay. D. Okay, we are doing everything with respect to some measure mu. Well, it's yeah. When when we are only dealing with one measure, we can just omit it. But uh, okay. So now we get the following: that mu f bigger than n is less than. 1 over n f d mu. So of course, at this point, I'm very tempted to go to the limit, to let n go to infinity. But we need to be a little careful. Let's call a n the set f bigger than n. What can I say about the sequence a n? It's a decreasing sequence. And we have a decreasing a passage to the limit uh, decreasing theorem under one condition, which is what? Yes, we need to have mu of a1, which is mu of f bigger than 1, finite. But this is less than, uh, and my inequality here shouldn't be strict. less than, uh, where according to the computation I did there, this is less than uh, the integral f d mu, which I'm assuming is finite. OK, that's my assumption, that I'm, I'm dealing with a finite integral. Yeah? So if this is true and this is decreasing, I can go to the limit. And when I let n go to infinity, I get mu of my intersection of all these sets a n. And on this side, I get 0, of course, because this is a finite number, and I'm dividing by n. So it's really crucial. I mean, we are using in several spots that this integral is finite. If I have something infinite here, my uh, whole computation is worthless. Okay, this is less than infinity, and that's it. Cannot let n go to infinity. 
So this works because we are assuming that. And so this is less than zero. Of course, this is a positive number. Therefore, it's equal to zero. Now, a set theory question, what is the intersection of all the f bigger than n? What's that? It must be equal to infinity. Otherwise, you know, you have nothing else there, right? Okay, the only way you can be bigger than every n is if you are in infinite. If you are a fixed number by the Archimedean property, you'll find an n bigger than you. So this is clearly mu of f equal to infinity. And that's equal to 0. So that's why we, we can say that f is finite almost everywhere, because where it's not finite is an L set. OK, so that's an important computation. Okay. That's the type of computation that you need to be able to do without looking at your notes. Okay, you have to, uh, there is a, uh, quite a bit of memorizing in these things. Okay, you need to be able to reproduce the arguments. Because that's how you are going to be able to do the, the problems afterwards. This type of argument will come up many times. This type of inequality, which is very simple, but very useful. The second part of the lemma is not so interesting, so I'm going to skip that and go to 14. So 14 was, OK, so we define a new measure. So we have our positive measurable function, and we define lambda of e as being the integral 1 e f. Uh, and we have the, uh, this other measure, which is given to us, which is mu, probably. Right. So we have two things to prove. First, that lambda is a measure. Okay, and so we'd like uh, to first thing you see that one e f is always positive. That's a positive uh, function because f is positive and one e is positive or zero. So lambda e when you you integrate this, you are certainly going to get something positive. You're going to get something which may be infinite, but is certainly not negative. Then if you look at uh, one empty set times f, well, this is a going to be identically 0 if you let e equal to the empty set, OK? because. Every time you take x, x of the indicator of the empty set is 0. Now, you may, you may be multiplying 0 by infinity, but we are not afraid of that. That's 0 for us, OK, by convention. So this is 0, and we know that the integral of 0 is 0. So lambda of the empty set is 0.
Okay, now we take uh, sequence EN of the, these joint sets, measurable sets, and we look at lambda V union of V EN. And that, by definition, is one union of EN F the mu. And the indicator of the union is the series EN. That's because your, uh, your ENs are disjoint. Okay, so if you belong to, if this guy is one, it means that you belong to one EN. But then you belong to exactly one EN. You cannot belong to several, otherwise they wouldn't be disjoint. Okay, on the other hand, if this guy is one, and that's the maximum you can get, is one, then it means that you belong to one EN, which means that you belong to the union. So you can do a double uh, inclusion or some well, it's not really an inclusion because this, these are not sets, but you, you can just argue that if this, if this is one, this is one, and this is one, this is one. So that's, uh, that's enough. So if you have this, then you come here, and you have this f in you. And here, you need something that we haven't done yet, but which is a direct consequence of a monotone convergence theorem, which tells you that you can invert the series and the integral. You can do that every time you have a series of positive functions then you can apply the monotone convergence theorem and you, you get this. Now, once you, are, you have this, then uh, you have lambda of EN and you are done. That's what you needed to show. Okay? So there was one step which you, you didn't quite have. It's in the book, but uh, we, I hadn't... Uh, I don't think I have done it yet, but I'm going to do it today. Questions? So, lambda is a measure. That's uh, the first part of the question. And then you want to prove a representation formula. And this proof is quite interesting because uh, it's, uh, it's a standard proof. It's, uh, the way to prove this is we'll, do, we'll use this technique several times. <coughs> Excuse me. So, at this point, what do we know? We know that lambda is a measure. And so we, we know we have a definition for, I, we don't care what the measure lambda is, we know that this is a well-defined symbol. Okay, we can integrate g, if it's a positive function, with respect to lambda. That's uh, not a problem for us. Now the question is, how do I relate this integral with respect to lambda to the integral with respect to mu? Since lambda is, is expressed in function of mu. Right? That's, that's how we define lambda. Just integrate uh, over the set, the function f, with respect to mu. Well, so the way to do this is to first start with g equal to an indicator, a simple function. Well, even simpler than a simple function. Just uh, one a where a is measurable. What happens? Well, one a d lambda is lambda of a, by definition, right? This is a simple function. That's how I integrate simple functions. Therefore, I have lambda of a. And what is lambda of a? Well, by definition of lambda of a, this is 1a 
gf d mu, which means that this is gf d mu. So when I integrate this function, this particular type of function, g, with respect to lambda, is like multiplying by f and integrating with respect to mu. This is the formula I'm trying to prove. Okay? So the formula holds for g equal 1a. The second step is to use simple functions. So if g is simple, it means that g is something like this, where, of course, all the ai's are measurable. They, then we want, again, to compute this guy, which is this. And now, we already know these properties of the integral. We know that uh, the integral is a linear operator. So we can just, uh, and this is, a linear, this is a finite sum, finite linear combination. So this is just uh, yeah, I don't have any g here. Right? I'm just doing the integral of g with respect to lambda. I'm using the properties of the integral that are always true. It doesn't matter what lambda is. And now I use what I did in the first step. You see, in the first step, I proved that we have, when, when g is equal to 1a, this integral is actually 1a f d mu. Right? This was done in the first step. So I know how to compute this guy. And now I, I put things together. I, I undo what I just did. And so what we get is that this is also, again, okay, now properties of the integral with respect to mu, which are the same, is the integral of the sum ai, 1 ai, f d mu. And so we end up with g f d mu. Okay, so we basically did no work. I mean, the only thing we did is use the first step to write that, uh, yes, it carries through. That's right? because the integral is a linear operator. And that's, what, that's the beauty of this method, is that many times, the only work you have to, to provide is at the first step with an indicator function, which is very simple. And then you go to, com to linear combination of indicators. And finally, you go to any positive function, which is easy because it's a limit of simple functions. And we can use the monoton convergence theorem. So that's uh, what we're going to do now. Well, y yeah, you can you can do that. That's called the radon nicotine derivative, okay. but it's not going to help you here. Okay. But uh, it's used all the time in probability and statistics because that's what you do. <laughs> well, I don't see yeah, at this point. In the D lambda in the integral, you get FDU. Okay. Yeah, but that's, that's basically what you are trying to prove. I mean, you're, you're, I think it's a little circular. But that's a good remark. I mean, that's, that's exactly what, uh, what, this is, what this is about. Yeah, for some reason, uh, then if you, if you look at the book, 
they, they always get very excited about this radon nicotine uh, derivative, but then they go into measures that are not positive measures. They are complex measures, and you know they get all excited. And uh, it's uh, well, from my point of view, it's not very useful. But I'm sure uh, you know a functional analyst would uh, would have his hair on his you know up on his head if uh, he heard that. But uh, from probability or more pedestrian things, you don't really use measures that are not real you know, and positive. OK, so we are not quite done because the first step is to take G a positive and measurable. Then we know that uh, there is a sequence Uh, Cn of simple functions such that for every x, Cn of x increases to g of x. Okay, that's, uh, so there are two statements here. One, your Cn of x is an increasing sequence for every x, and it converges to g of x. So now uh, we do where well, we, we do the computation. We compute g d lambda. And we say, well, this is a limit of Cn d lambda. Okay, just uh, replacing g by limit of, C, of Cn. Now, because these are positive functions, remember, everything we're doing here is for positive functions. And it's an increasing sequence of positive functions. We can use a monotone convergence theorem, one of the main theorems of the theory. And that theorem tells you you can pull your limit out whenever you feel like it. Okay, but now step two tells us that we know how to integrate a simple function with respect to lambda. Okay, so we do that this is, so let me repeat the limit, but each one of these guys is just f cn d mu. This is step two. Now, at this point, we say the following. Well, but f of cn is increasing to fg. That's because f is a positive function. OK, and we are talking about pointwise convergence. So if, f, if cn of x converges to g of x, f cn of x converges to fg of x. That's all. So we can again use the monotone convergence theorem uh, doing the reverse of what we just did and say, well, this is limit inside of f c n d mu, which is f g d mu. And we are done. So the formula holds now in general for every f which is positive and measurable. Questions? Did I assign 15? Okay. So many times when you, you have to prove a formula like that, think about these three steps method. Actually, it's a four steps method, because then what you do is you do it for any function, positive or otherwise. So you go to, pos you go to uh, indicator, simple, positive, real. So you have four steps. Too. 
So this time we still have a positive sequence of functions, but they decrease, and we are told that f1 d mu is finite. But the monotone convergence theorem, which is really uh, not well named, works for increasing sequence, not any monotone. I mean, decreasing is not in uh, the statement there. And you do need an additional uh, uh, hypothesis like this. This should really remind you, because it's really uh, a generalization, of the thing with sets. When it's a decreasing sequence of sets, you can pass to the limit, provided the measure is finite. OK, so that's exactly what we are saying here. And you do a proof which is uh, similar to the proof we did where for decreasing sets, if you remember, because you can define Gn to be f1 minus fn. And now you have an increasing sequence of functions. And because fn is decreasing, you also have a Gn is positive, which is crucial. OK, don't... Re don't uh, Forget that. Okay. So now you can apply the monotone convergence theorem, and uh, it tells you that the limit of G n is G d mu. And here is a problem with my proof. Because what I need at this point is to say that G and D mu is, uh, well, F1 D mu minus F and D mu. And we have not seen this property. Okay? Because we have been dealing with positive functions only, we have seen that uh, uh, if, if you have positive constants, then it's linear. But we haven't seen anything with negative constants yet. We are going to see this in the next section. So it's, I think it's, if you avoid this step, it's, it makes things a lot more complicated. Uh, at least I couldn't think of a simple proof without using this fact. But so that's, that's a shortcoming here. And uh, G d mu is going to be, uh, so G d mu is going to be uh, f1 minus f. And of course, everything is finite here, because uh, your fn is always less than f1. And so uh, fn d mu is always less than f1 d mu, which we assume is finite. And f is also less than f1, the limit. And so f d mu is also finite. So we are only dealing with numbers, not, not infinity, when we are writing these things. And so you just do you you just have your your uh, equality here, which is going to tell you that the limit in n of so so this part is f one d mu minus the limit in n of f n d mu is equal to the integral of g is f1 d mu minus uh, f d mu. And of course, you, you can cancel your f1 d mu, and you are left with what you want, that the limit of uh, the integrals f n d mu is equal to f d mu. Okay, so really an easy consequence of the monotone convergence theorem. Okay. 
and I think I signed 17 too. So 17, 17 we are assuming fat 2 and we want to prove the monotone convergence theorem. The way we did it in class was to, uh, to prove a monotone convergence theorem first and show that it implied fat 2. Okay, so uh, we're going to show that fat 2 implies a mountain congruence theorem. Okay, so we're assuming that fn is increasing to f and they are all positive functions. And then we write what fat 2 says that the lim inf of fn is less than the lim inf of the integral of f. Now, because fn converges to f, this is f. So we have that f is less than this. And the other thing we note is that uh, because fn is less than fn plus 1, the integral of fn is less than the integral of fn plus 1, which means that the integral of fn is an increasing sequence, and so it converges. Well, maybe infinity, but uh, it has a limit. Okay, so this again, I can replace my lim inf by just limit of fn. So this is what Fatou tells me: that the integral of the limit is less than the limit of the integral. That's the difficult inequality. The other inequality is trivial and will be done. Okay, that's why FA2 is useful. Because the other inequality uh, is trivial because of the following, it's an increasing sequence. So you are smaller than F. Okay, you are always, for an increasing sequence, you are, your, any term of your sequence is less than your limit. And so the integral of Fn is less than the integral of F which means that the limit of fn is less than f, than the integral of f. So we have the, the inequality that was missing. Okay, we put together our two inequalities and we get what we want. We get the monotone convergence theorem. Okay, so if we do this plus this, we get the monotone convergence theorem. Questions? So I guess that was it for the homework. Uh, so let's finish this section on positive functions, and in particular, uh, corollary of uh, the monotone convergence theorem. says the following, that if the fn are measurable and positive, then the integral of the series is equal to the series of the integrals. The proof of that, uh, when you have series, you many times you need partial sums. So you define your partial sum uh, to be a n, to be the sum from k equal 1 to, maybe this is not such a good notation, let's call it uh, g n.
or fifth k. Okay, so we do a partial sum of the f's. And by definition, so, well, first thing, gn is increasing because you keep adding positive terms. So you have something increasing. And therefore, gn uh, converges to <coughs> the infinite series. Okay, that's what the definition of a series is. It's a limit of partial sums. Okay? Now, because it's increasing and positive, we can use the monotone convergence theorem and say, which tells us that the limit of gn is equal to the integral of the limit. Now we compute both sides, and we are done. Okay, the first uh, side, when we have integral of gn, it's integral of a sum from k equal 1 to n of fk, which is the sum of integrals. It's a finite sum, so we get this. Now, when we do the limit of this thing, it's the limit of the right-hand side. And that is, by definition, the series of integrals. OK, the limit of this is the infinite series. Now, why does the infinite series exist? Again, because this is an increasing sequence. Okay, as n increases, I, I keep adding integrals that are positive. So this thing has a limit. So we get this on this side. And on the other side, we get, okay, when we do s uh, integral of limit of gn, we get integral of the infinite series. And by the monotone convergence theorem, both sides are equal. So this is equal to that. That's the monotone convergence theorem. And we're done. Okay, so that's a, that's a useful corollary. Yeah. Another thing that I want to mention in this section is that the monotone convergence theorem and the and Fatou's lemma are uh, true even if uh, we don't have strictly increasing sequences, even if it's almost everywhere. So that's what we're going to do now is, uh, is the almost everywhere version of the monotone convergence theorem. So assume that fn of x is increasing to some f of x 
almost everywhere. Meaning that the set of axes for which this is not true is an R set. Okay? Then uh, we we still have the conclusion of a Martin. We still have the same conclusion. So you see, the only difference is this almost everywhere. Okay. So I can I, I can still have the same conclusion. How do you prove that? Let E be the, all the axes for which f n of x is increasing to f of x. OK, we look at all the axes for which things are right. And uh, then we, what do we do? Well, there are several, OK. Uh, Okay. So what we can observe first is that 1 E F N increases to 1 E F. Okay. I take an X in here. So F N of X is increasing to F of X. That's the definition of being in E. And therefore, the limit of this guy is exactly this. If x is not in E, then this is 0, and this is 0. And this is still a true statement. So this works everywhere, Okay, for every x. Okay, So this is for every x. Therefore, the monotone convergence theorem applies. The limit of this guy is the mountain convergence theorem. And now our task is to get rid of E, to say, well, this is still true if we don't restrict ourselves to E. And the reason this is true is that, so this is, okay, so how can we say that? Yeah. So we need a little lemma here, because this will pop up in other places, too. Assume that uh, okay. So assume that mu of e is 0, of a complement of, the, of e is 0, and f is a, is a positive function. Let's call it g, because we have already g is a positive measurable function, then the integral of g is the integral of 1e g. And that's very easy to see, because so proof of a lemma. Uh, we can write that well, g is g one e d mu plus g one complement of e d mu. Uh, you, you are either in E or you are in the component of E. Now, G 1 E complement is different from 0 if X belongs to the component of E. Or another way to say this is that G 1 E complement is 0 almost everywhere. 
Okay. In order for this thing not to be zero, you must have your x in your complement of E. But complement of E has measure zero. Therefore, this function is zero almost everywhere. And we proved already that a function which is zero almost everywhere has an integral which is zero. So that proves the lemma. This integral is equal to that one. And that's what we need here. Okay, we go back now to this equality, and we say that this is actually the integral of fn, and this is the integral of f, and we're done. Okay? So by lemma, So the monotone convergence theorem holds. Okay, you can just replace this guy without E and this guy without E. And you see many of the theorems that you are going to state will be with almost everywhere hypothesis. Because you can many times you can do this trick and get rid of a neglectable uh, set. Questions? OK, so. We are about to start the new section, 2.3. Uh, so let's, let's have a 10 minutes break, and we'll continue this.